Hello, I'm fine. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Very good. Okay, let's uh, crack straight on with it. You're presenting your screen already. That looks good. So I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Thank you. So hi, everyone. We'll be discussing today the developer ecosystem around financial services and APIs. Um, before we do that, briefly who we are, uh, because I'll be showing you a lot of data points so you can understand where that comes from. So we're Slash Data. Our mission is to understand, uh, help the world understand developers and share insights about who developers are, what technology choices they make, and where they're going next. And these insights which we share with the tech leading platforms, uh, such as the ones you see here. And how we do that? We survey developers twice per year. Uh, we've done that 90 times already. We reach more than 30K developers every time, roughly 160 countries. We do that through a network of eight, seven plus partners from small local meetups to uh, large uh, vendor communities. And we do that so that we capture uh, the views of all developers out there, representative sample, and not follow through the views of a specific panel of people through time. We uh, research 10 development areas, the ones you see here on the left, and we ask about all of those every single time on purpose because uh, we find that uh, the typical developer is active in uh, more than one of these. So we want to capture the full experience across sectors to really understand uh, what's happening. Um, okay, and with that out of the way, as I said, our mission is to understand developers. And for this particular session, we will focus on a subgroup of them, the ones that are active in the financial sector, actually two subgroups, the ones that are active in the financial sector, how many there are, uh, who they are exactly. And also those, there's obviously a big overlap, but it's not just the financial sector, all of those who use finance and banking APIs and those using payment APIs. And then briefly, I will tell you how and why you would need to dive deeper. Right, first things first, we need to set the context. Uh, so we're going to discuss the size of the developer ecosystem in the finance world. First of all, how big is the developer world overall? So currently we estimate there are 21.3 uh, million developers globally. I do not have the time to go into the detail of how we came to with that number. Um, happy to answer um, questions later in our booth if you want. Um, for now, I'll just say we have five different independent methodologies of estimating that, five different data sources on top of ours. And happily, all of these estimates converge around the same number. Have we been doing that for a few years now? And we can tell you that the developer world, as you probably, many of you already know, it's, it's booming, it's growing really, really fast, has grown by 26% in the last two years. And at that rate, we expect to see something close to 24 million developers globally by the end of Q3, 21. And out of this 21 million, first of all, overall, there are 15.3 million uh, professional developers and 2.5 in particular are active in the financial sector. And since Q1, 19, that we have been tracking the specific industries, we can tell you that this sector has grown really, really fast. As you can see, it has gone by 32%. Uh, the number of professional developers active here um, in 18 months. Um, the um, overall growth rate for all professional developers in the same period was 19%. So this sector is growing fast. Why? That's one of the reasons why we will be looking into this sector. The other is it's actually the second biggest sector in which developers are active after the tech industry itself. So financial services, banking insurance is what we call um, the biggest vertical industry, vertical to tech, that is, that employs developers. So 17% are currently in that sector, very closely followed by those who are active in data analytics and BI. And of course, we track some like 22 different industries there. I'm just showing you the top 10 here. And I can tell you those 22 actually capture nearly all of developers, just 3%, so they're doing something else. Um, and here, uh, just a side note, I'm also pointing out another three industries. So data analytics and BI is number two. As I said, there's also another two there in the top 10, nine and 10. So marketing and business consulting. So BI, marketing and business consulting are supportive 
industries that are so that support the business functions. Um, and next time I'll do that. I'll do it for these for these sectors because they're very important um, in the whole you know across all other industries in supporting them. And twenty percent, twenty one, I think, um, are actually in those three um, in these sec these sectors. There's overlap, obviously. Developers sometimes not very certain where they fit in, but anyways, 20% are in those as well. Now, back to the financial services. To understand the boom, we need to understand who is in the sector. So first of all, experience. So we, we compare the experience of developers in the financial services and banking and insurance sector as compared to all other professional developers in all other sectors. And on average, you can see that the ones in the financial sector are more experienced. You can see 85% there uh, have more than three years of experience. Now, there are two key reasons behind this. One is traditionally, let's say, um, you can find developers have been in that sector for, I don't know, certainly more than a decade. Um, so on one side, these are the enterprise IT guys in there, but, and that's the most interesting part for today, it's not just them. It's also professional, experienced developers who are spilling into the sector and driving the boom. Okay, so what do they do in this sector? Again, we track several roles, 25 or so. Here I'm pointing out the roles that are more prominent in the financial sector um, as compared to others. And yes, you get to see more programmers and software developers exactly because you have all the teams in the large um, institutions there, and they, you know, hitting code all the time, right? You don't get the designers or, or different roles that you get to see elsewhere. Um, but what I will focus on is this one. So you also have more tech team leads, which implies you have more dev teams, which implies you have more specialization, right? Plus, adding to that, it's more likely to find specialists in this sector, to find architects, to find DevOps services. Yes, it's just 8%, but it's still bigger than elsewhere. So more experience, more specialization in this sector so far. All right, and what about the size of the organization, where they work? And yes, of course, in this sector, you have the big guns, right? The five big financial institutions, the big insurance companies, and what have you, and therefore, it's far less likely to find developers working for startups and far more likely to find enterprise developers working at the high end at the really big organizations. Yes, so what? Well, the so what is actually, if I can flip this over, what is most interesting here is that 40% uh, are actually, so the first three, three columns here, 40% are in organizations of up to 100 people and these are not the banks, obviously. So what are they? So we asked about their business models. How, do, uh, how does your organization make money out of development projects, either directly or indirectly? Indirectly being brand awareness, being cost saving, being infrastructure for sales, um, and so on. So again, I'm just showing you four out of the many, uh, just to focus on the ones that are different for the financial sector. OK, the top and the bottom one are kind of the traditional ones. So the bottom one, um, indirectly, so all these are all the IT people, right? They're just building all the infrastructure that somehow directly or indirectly related to bringing in the money. And at the top, you have consulting. So in the financial sector, obviously more than in others, um, it's quite common to outsource some of the development projects, the ones that are not critical, they're not very close to the heart the organization, not very security sensitive and so on. These have always been um, outsourced. Um, actually, however, now it will be very interesting to see what part of this is in order to build cloud infrastructure. I'll have a look, um, but not today. Um, but what is most interesting here is this. So in this sector, it's far from more likely to find developers who make a living out of selling APIs and building tools and APIs more than in other sectors. And that, with that in mind, I can, you know, we, we're perfectly you know, confident that this is one, not the one, but one of the main drivers behind the boom of this sector 
the existence of the APIs in the financial sector. And why should you care? That's all very nice to us at least, um, but why should you care? Because I've heard people say, well, developers are just developers. Well, no, developers are also decision makers. We find that 70% of developers are somehow involved in the tooling uh, buying decisions, and that's why you should care. Now, again, comparing the professionals in the financial sector uh, to all others, are there any differences? Again, 7% of them as well are involved somehow. And at the personal level, when they're buying tools for their own use, they're no different to others. Where differences start happening is when you compare what they buy and how involved they are in those decisions in their um, company setting. So this is very interesting. Actually, they appear to be less involved. That's adults with what just I just said, right? So I, I got my team to dive a bit deeper in here, understand what's happening. And what's happening is that developers who are entry level roles, those who say they're just programmers or those who are just data analysts or data scientists, they're less involved in decision making as compared to their peers with similar roles uh, in other sectors. And similarly, those with lower experience, so less than six years, are far less likely to be taking part in the decision-making process as compared to their peers with relevant you know, level of experience in other sectors. And that's the company size, that's the enterprise structure behind this. Because in large organizations, the decision is happening further up the hierarchy, so the junior guys are not really involved. So that's what you see here. But once they're involved, they are influencers. So they're not more likely or less likely than others to be the ones approving the overall budgets and so forth, but they're more likely to be influencers. This was multiple choice, by the way, um, other than the no um, answers. So that's why you see big uh, percentages here. So my point is, that if you're trying to sell an API or whatever development tool um, to developers in that sector, bear in mind, you're talking most likely to the more experienced and the more specialized and those higher up in the hierarchy. So you should be adjusting your messaging accordingly. Right, that's all for those who are into the financial sector per se. Now let's see what's happening with not just them, them as well, but all of those who are using APIs, financial APIs and payment APIs. Before I go into those in particular, again, let's set the context. APIs have taken over the world, or the development world at least. Um, so all developers, 89% are using APIs. And this is usage of APIs is far more common actually among professionals. So it's 93% of professionals who are using APIs and combining this with the population numbers I showed you, that means that we'll have just above 19 million developers globally who use APIs and 14.2 million professional developers who use APIs. That's quite a lot. And it's enough to assume that therefore APIs have quite a lot um, been, important role to play in shaping the trends in development. Um, and as you can see, the vast majority is actually using third-party APIs, so publicly available APIs, not just the ones behind uh, the private walls of companies. All right, so which ones? We track 17 different categories. These are the top 10 for professionals that I'm showing you here. So payment APIs is number one, and that's one reason why we're talking about them as well. Um, and finance and banking and towards the bottom there, number nine. And if we were to use at the ranking for all developers, not just professionals, finance and banking will sadly disappear from top 10, as you might expect. Now, um, another way in which professionals uh, use APIs differently is that they use more categories, not, not specific APIs only, but different categories of APIs. So they use 3.5 different categories of APIs simultaneously as compared to 2.8, uh, I believe, across the board. So payment and finance banking APIs is the two categories uh, I'll be now looking into. Um, and so we try to see for these two categories, how far they have penetrated different sectors, different industries. So this is a penetration rate 
it's out of those who are active in financial services, for example, what percentage is using finance APIs, what percentage is using payment APIs. Two key points. One, for the finance uh, and banking APIs, you see the penetration is the biggest by far still in their native world, so in the financial sector itself. One in three in that sector actually uses finance uh, and uh, APIs, which in itself is quite interesting. Real estate follows, but at some distance, but has a head start as compared to all other se sectors that follow. But it's a different story for payment APIs that have penetrated several sectors, right? So you can see here, it's uh, hospitality, it's also marketing, it's also uh, retail, of course, and it's real estate. So payment APIs, have penetrated more industries than finance APIs, which, however, that said, these are no small percentages either. It was not like that. Okay, so and in what size of organizations are they being used? So as you can see, payment APIs are mostly used in small companies. And it sort of makes sense because Payments, the way the company receives payments is one of its core functions. So it's part of its core business. So as it, as the company grows, it's quite natural that this is a process that will be internalized rather than um, done through an API. So yes, payment APIs. Well, you know, a small startup will not try to reinvent the wheel there. They'll just use a payment API. But for finance and banking APIs, company size does not matter. Please remember that when we see the next slide, it does not matter. Um, they are used equally across the different company sizes. What is different for finance and banking APIs is the money, the value of the company. Um, these are on different scale. I just wanted you to focus on the slope here of the two. So this is how usage of the two types of APIs is linked to the value of the company, the revenue they are making either directly or indirectly on a monthly basis um, through development. And as you can see, the higher the revenue, the higher the usage of finance and banking APIs. And you may be inclined to say that this is because in the financial, these are used mostly in the financial sector and the financial sector, we have the big guns with the big organizations, but didn't I just show you that usage of finance and banking APIs is not linked to company size. So I'm sorry, this is not it. It's something else. So uh, we would need to dive deeper, deeper. I would bet money that if we look at the small companies, this is actually going to be uh, steeper. Um, but for now, what this says is that finance and banking APIs are closer to the value, closer to the money, to the end result. Well, payment APIs, you can see on the right, it's a flat line, right? they are related more to the core function of the company. It has nothing to do with incremental value. So that's a very key difference between the two. And I could go on and on and on and show you differences between the two. But at the end of the day, what you would need to do is build some personas, as we call them, run some segmentation, as we prefer to call them in this world, um, and understand who is using each type of APIs. So um, my team kindly did that um, for these two types and compared who use versus doesn't use payment APIs and who uses versus doesn't use finance and banking APIs. So really rough uh, right now, um, but I hope you'll get my point. So there are some common features between users of the two types. They're um, in both cases, very likely to be professionals in web, mobile and backend because that's where these type of APIs are more likely to be uh, deployed. And otherwise, they uh, may be working on mobile payments, which also makes sense. But then they have some unique features. So as we, as we just said, payment APIs have penetrated several industries. So they're not necessarily in the financial and insurance sector. While it's very likely that they are in the financial and insurance sector if they're using uh, finance and banking APIs. And if they're not, then it's very likely that they're involved in machine learning projects. Here, you may want to think um, of um, stock market predictions or fraud detection, even recommendation systems in some cases. 
Now, um, payment APIs, we also have people who have some tooling decision power. Remember, uh, they are used in smaller companies. And in smaller companies, there are more people who have a say on tooling decisions. So those are linked. And they're also more likely to be using um, continuous integration and deployment for mobile. That would need a bit more digging into. But for sure, uh, these are professionals. Um, and therefore, the less likely users uh, of these APIs are whole business students and developers who are not full stack developers. So hopefully by now, I have demonstrated that you need to understand developers um, because they're decision makers and that their profiles do differ in many ways. You would also need to understand, to go deeper than that, what exactly it is that they appreciate in an API, why this versus that, especially as the whole space is booming and growing, how will they pick their next one? So we have done that. We have asked developers how they select uh, APIs. And we have given the uh, 14 different reasons to choose from. And they're not all technical. Some are technical, such as communication protocols and other format and all that. But some are more um, about support and community and resources. And then we also ask them what are the top challenges they're facing uh, with third party APIs. And again, we ask about technical and non technical stuff. And ta-da, and give you a spoiler, it's not the technical attributes that are the most challenging. They are very important. They do surface as very important, naturally. However, the, the sector is already mature enough so that um, the technical aspects of APIs are not such a big challenge anymore. What is challenging for developers is everything around your API offering. So things like documentation, support, community, other resources. Another reason, therefore, why you should understand developers, because you need to understand what are their specific needs and wants, and therefore, that you, so that you can uh, design effective resources for them. And then you would need to understand more specifically about the specific APIs that they use. And this is what exactly we are doing right now. So our 20th survey is currently running. And we're asking about specific APIs, such as the ones you see here on the right, Stripe, and so on, um, and whatever, if they're using an in-house uh, solution, why? And we ask how aware they are of each one of those uh, if they're using them, how happy they are with them, why they selected each and every one of them, why, and why they rejected them if they have rejected them. And we also ask them how happy they are with them, not in general, but on the specific attributes that they consider important, such as scalability or whatever else. And we also ask what type of applications they build with third-party finance and banking APIs in particular. So if you are in that sector and you are using APIs such as that, you may want to take the survey and let us know your thoughts. And I do promise I will come back with some of the results. You've got on video, so I cannot get away now. And that's all from me for today. I'm happy to take your questions. That, that was a, a lot of data. <laughs> Thanks. I was, I was thinking of making screenshots of all of that, studying it at home. But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Really good. We we did get uh, we did get one question, so I'll, I'll just throw that at you uh, very quickly as well. From uh, Emily, she she's asked basically, um, what are some patterns around the personas that you're seeing, and what framework did you use to assess the maturity? She's saying basically, okay, you know, it'd be different if you're a big company like Visa versus some uh, you know smaller companies. Um, so in terms of what what did we use to come up with the personas? Um, of course, we track, first of all, um, we do not use the technical choices as part of the model because this is what you're trying to predict. Uh, therefore, as inputs to our own models um, is uh, our all everything else that is, um, first of all, demographics, but also thermographics and also motivations, what they're trying to build, that kind of thing. Um, also, we do not make any prior assumptions. So I've seen many um, companies um, in the tech industry and elsewhere trying to build segmentation and build personas by making assumptions and you know, drawing little 
people based on that. Um, but um, you should really let the data speak. This is what we find. And in some cases, we find that the data actually tell the truth. Uh, no, in all cases, they tell the truth. Um, and they, they paint a picture that makes sense. Um, so I don't know, you know if you want more technical detail than that. I'm happy to answer that in our booth. But that's the general idea. So we try to um, understand developers. Say, therefore, we would focus on API users. We'll take, we'll define our population. Who are we interested in here? So professional developers, for example, and then try to identify the different clusters uh, based on all the parameters that are descriptive of them, not of their choices, and then link their profiles to their low choices. Who is more likely to be using technology A versus B? And what was the second one? There was a second part to this question. Well, it, it was basically, okay, how does it differ between bigger companies? But uh, I, I think you're going, uh, you're going to your booth, right? So um, yes, if anyone's like, you know, if this is a burning topic for you, just cruise across to there and, and, and have a chat uh, with uh, Christina directly. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk.